You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Imagine you walk into a space. It's a a dark, empty space, but there's a spotlight on a giant metal sculpture. It's like three stories high towering over you. You press a button and all of a sudden that giant metal figure starts to shake and you hear a sound, an overwhelming sound as thousands of bells ring out. That is the immersive experience created by Sharuvi Agrawal and her record-setting sculpture, 26,000 Bells of Hanuman. I feel like who Art Ed? Who tried to spice it? Who Art Ed? Mr. Wood, (laughs) Art Ed, me. Either way, it's ambiguous. It works on so many levels. I know. That's off to great. Welcome to Who Arted, where we explore visual arts in an audio medium. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and joining me today is one of my oldest friends, Anders Van Marder. Thanks for joining me. Hey, Kyle. How's it going? <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so happy that I could have you for this because, like, not just because you are the reason that I am, you know, where I am. You are one of the people who said, like, you're kind of a terrible musician, but you're adequate at painting. Oh um, <laughs> uh, you, you know it's true. That. No, <laughs> you're good at both. You're really good no, at but, both. But, but, like, you and Colleen, like, literally dragged me to the Art Institute. Um, and, and I will be forever grateful for that. But oh. also... For this particular one, you know, I, I I appreciate like having not only an accomplished musician but sound engineer to talk about a sound sculpture, because a lot of people think of like visual arts, you know, as just something to look at, but this engages all the senses. Yeah, no, thank you very much for uh, having me. When you told me about this idea, I got really curious about this artist, and I started watching some of her stuff online and I'm really excited to uh, talk to you about it. It's, it's amazing stuff, isn't it? It's so, so cool. It's so cool and it's so different and I am excited to talk about all the, the different pieces of it. Yeah. So I, I always want to start off with a little bit of the background. So Sharuvi Agrawal, um, she was born in 1983. It was a good year for, for making people. That's when I was born, too. Um, and I guess her dad worked in aviation. So it seems like she kind of grew up traveling around India. And she works in different disciplines. Um, you know, I remember one of my one of my art teachers lamenting the fact that like artists sort of get pigeonholed because like they, they make their career by becoming identifiable with one certain thing. And it kind of reminded me of, um, of like, I saw an interview, I think it was Aerosmith, Steven Tyler talking about how like, it's kind of a bummer for him to record a new album because he knows that 90% of the songs he records, he will never play again once they get out of the studio because they have to play the hits. Yeah. Yeah. And you only have so much room and, you know, and and in the visual arts, a lot of, a lot of times an artist becomes known for like one certain specific style. And it's like, they just got to keep doing that. You know, Jackson Pollock's got to keep dripping. Right. And Sharuvi Agrawal, she doesn't get into that box. Like she paints, she sculpts, she animates, she's a filmmaker. She, she's doing lots of different stuff and bringing lots of different stuff together, which I thought was really awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Her being a multidisciplinary artist is just, it's so cool for so many reasons, but um, she excels at, at all of those specifics that you just mentioned, which is really noteworthy you know for for a lot of artists yeah we we do have to stick to a particular medium or a particular instrument and she's just so she's so talented and disciplined that she does all of them and really well which is yeah unusual yeah and I think I think that's a really good point is that you know she's not just dabbling in a bunch of things she's excelling in a bunch of different media um, and she, she showed that, that propensity for arts from a young age. Like, as I was reading about her, one of the, one of the first stories I read that like, just like, I, I, I just gravitated towards immediately was just like, she talked about like, it almost sounded like a trauma of like, you know, an art teacher saying like when she was in year six or something like that, 
she made a self-portrait and they said, that's too sophisticated for you. They threw it away and made her make another one. Um, wow. Which <laughs> I know, I know. Luckily, like that didn't stop her. She had that persistence. She she felt that drive and she kept she kept making things. And I believe that one even later on, like she scavenged it and like put it into a competition and it became like an award winning piece for, you know, her, for her age group in some sort of competition. And she's earned lots of recognitions, like aside from like the standard validation that comes from like, she got her BFA from the college of arts, new Delhi, and she got a master's degree from, the Sheridan Institute of Technology and Advanced Learning in Canada, which who knew Canada has, you know, like schools that go beyond Degrassi, but um, <laughs> Canada I'm just has joking. amazing I, schools. <laughs> yeah, no, she is. She's really she's academically accomplished and then she's accomplished in her industry as well. I mean, she's yeah. she's a, she's a powerhouse. <laughs> Yeah. And while she was earning that master's in computer animation, like she started working on on films like student films that started to get a little bit of recognition. Like it started she started to produce things that made the rounds on sort of like the the film festival circuit. So like the 10th Avatar was the piece that started to to build a little bit of a reputation for her. And so after she graduated from that program, she she got this offer to do a th- a 3D animated film on the Hindu god of Hanuman. And she was a little bit leery of it because on the one hand, like it was a ton of money. It was a huge payday. But on the other hand, the the promoter had kind of a dodgy reputation and she was worried like she was not like the funding would not come through in the end. She decided to take that gamble and she started, um, she started CDL, um, Sharuvi Design Labs. And so in 2009, she started that, that studio hiring like 30 animators and they worked on 2D, 3D animations, visual effects, art installations, like virtual reality and augmented reality and just like cross disciplinary work in creative fields. But the big thing was that Hanuman animation, because like she spent three years producing that. And I think, as you can imagine, if you spend three years on on one certain topic, you either love it or you hate it. Yes. You know, (laughs) very (laughs) true. Like like you either you it is either a passion that you want to keep pursuing or it is something you never want to see again when you're done. And you know, she, I guess, really became devoted to Hanuman. And this is the part where I'm going to uncomfortably acknowledge that I don't want to speak too much about uh, religion as a public school educator and all of that sort of stuff. But I think it is worth understanding a little bit about Hinduism. And, you know, Hinduism is a polytheistic religion and Hanuman is one of the, the deities. He is considered to be one of, I think it's eight immortals in in that religion. And uh, Hanuman is one of the most popular deities in that, um, that many people are devoted to because of his virtues. Hanuman is, Hanuman is seen as very much sort of an ideal figure because of like Hanuman is a companion to the God Rama. Um, and it's very low, very loyal, um, very like strong, brave, and, you know, just like really nobody could find fault with him. So he's associated with meditation, scholarship, strength, devotion, self-control, faith, service to a cause, like all of those sort of virtuous ideals are in Hanuman. And she obviously was taken with that, that story and devotion to, to Hanuman. And that later served as the inspiration to keep going beyond that 3d animated piece, because the, the installation I described earlier the 26,000 bells, which also earned her recognition because that was a record setting piece in the Limca book of world records. Um, that is a sculpture of Hanuman. So shall we do a little bit of a deeper dive into, um, that specific sculpture? Let's do it. (laughs) So 
I guess I always like to start off with just like, what's jumping out to you? What do you notice about this piece? Oh my gosh. There, there's so many things. It's sort of if, if I pull back from this piece and just think about art itself, how other people are experience it, experiencing it, what they're seeing, what they're feeling, what they're hearing, what they're sensing. This piece, um, I immediately noticed that anyone could have an interaction with it. It, you know, like you said, it's it's a theistic form of art, or art form, rather. Um, depending on the different, you know, senses that you're able to engage, if, you know, you, you can't see, you can still hear this piece. Um, if you can't hear, you can see the piece. Um, there's an element of touching that's involved. So, I mean, there's, she's, she's so brilliant in that she created something that, like, almost anyone can engage with. Uh, and so I think that's the thing that I'm just like, you know, you look at it and it's very beautiful, but it's also like, wow, this is really a piece of art for like everyone. And that's the thing that I'm just like, you know, this paintings are beautiful and, and they can be so engaging. Um, you know, music, it's so beautiful and so engaging, but those are still, you know, separate kind of dimensions. And she brings that together. And I think that that is just, it's stunning, you know? Yeah, I think I think that's a really good point. And the openness to interpretation for everybody, like, I, I know, I've seen um, Agrawal talking in like a, a like a TEDx type of situation. And she talks about how, you know, with art, it's open to so many different interpretations. And that's what she loves about the creative mindset is that everybody will see the same stimulus and have a different reaction. And with this, she's doing a lot of things that are are really interesting because there's so much specificity to it, like the the bell being sort of symbolic because the bell has real significance in the the Hindu tradition. Um, typically, you would you would ring a bell when entering into a Hindu temple to make the deity aware of your presence, but also to um, sort of like the ringing of the bell. It, it blocks out other things. The sound sort of clears your mind. It gets you focused and into that mind, into that proper mind space. So the bells as the specific object that's used to make this has, has that meaning, but it also has just that sensory experience that even if you're not aware of the tradition and the, the symbolic importance of the bell, it still just looks and sounds cool. It is still just a shiny metal object that gar that, grabs our attention. We see that sculpture that, you know, to, to those in the know, it is Hanuman. And to those who are just coming to this for the first time and don't have that background, it is just a large looming presence. It's 25 feet tall. It is this, it is recognizable as a figure of some sort, even if you don't know who specifically it is. And what I find really interesting also just in terms of the aesthetics is the way that the strings the bells are hanging from also sort of come together in this piece to to alter the visual. It looks like it it almost helps to keep that spotlight on him or it almost looks like something that's like raining down like a, like showering down. There's this shimmering to the strings as well, which I find interesting. Yeah, that that is something to me that also really stands out. It the the whole form of the sculpture is so masterfully executed that even the sort of mechanical um, pieces of it, um, you know, she's not hiding them. It, it's in full view, and and even that is beautiful. And like you said, it has this like shimmering aspect to it, almost like rain that's like coming down. Um, it's really so cool how she was able to incorporate the bells and the mechanics that hold them together into this really seamless piece. Um, again, just really masterful execution. Yeah. What is your favorite um, part of this or what is the, th the thing that stands out most to you? I think to me, what's, what's really interesting about it and what takes it to a whole other level is the fact that, you know, I have I had my immediate reaction when I first saw 
that sculpture, um, like when I first saw documentation of it and you see like the scale of it and it just, it just looks cool visually. And then every time I've looked at it and read about it or seen video of it in action and things like that, it's just, it's more to discover. You know, there's, there's, there's so many layers to it that like every time I investigate more, it's just like, oh, wow, I see what you did there. And that was really clever because of, you know, the sound of the the bell and the connection to Ulm and the, the spiritual significance of that. And, you know, like just all of those things coming together, I think is really, really interesting. And also because, as I've said, we often think of the visual arts as distinctly visual and this sort of static object. And the idea that even something that is so massive, 25 feet tall, you press you press a button there's like it's 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 like um i think there's this pedestal that has like like feet like you press down and then it activates this movement that is like this giant comes to life it is kinetic there's literal movement to it that sends ripples down the sculpture but also the air around it as the sound waves come out and envelop you and i just think that is so powerful and awesome that she's creating these experiences that that transcend visual arts and incorporate all the senses like that's what a good installation does to me is it creates this immersive experience that transforms the space yeah and i mean a lot of times you know i'm not a visual artist but i i feel like you know in in speaking with you and some other visual artists um, or visiting galleries or museums or talking to people that have installed installations, you know, often um, the space that the piece is in, it may or may not impact the sort of total impact of what you're seeing. But what's interesting about her piece is that absolutely the setting is going to impact um, what you see in here with this piece for a number of reasons. You know, um, if the piece is outside, um, you know, there's wind, which will change the sound. Uh, in general, the acoustics of an indoor versus outdoor venue are going to be different. Um, so there's a sort of, um, you know, she can use those elements to, to change the experience uh, of what people are, you know, seeing or hearing or feeling. So I feel like, I mean, I really just think this artist is so brilliant for like all the reasons we've discussed and that, you know, like you said, you go back to this piece and every time you look at it or think about it, there's something new that you're learning. And I really wonder for her, like how she was able to bucket all these different variables when making this piece. Um, It's such a testament to how smart this person is that, you know, they've accounted for these different things and to truly be um, a multimedia artist, you have to be thinking about that. So it's like, it's such a complex piece but it's just hitting on so many cool things. Yeah. And, and I think it's, as you talk about the development process, it's worth mentioning, you know, like she was, as I said, spending three years working on that 3d animation of the Hanuman story, that narrative. And so she was obviously doing extensive research to build to this understanding. And she didn't start off with 26,000 bells. She started off with sketches and then prototypes using, I think it was like a couple thousand pearls on strings, making like a smaller scale um, version of it to work out the ideas, to work out the logistics before going to that larger scale and having, you know, it was obviously a team of artists working together to execute the final product. And I think they worked for days to do that um, every time it's been put up. Yeah. I saw that one of her prototypes was, it was a six foot um, piece. And and yeah, I think, I'm not sure if the six foot piece had the bells on it or pearls, but yeah, she scaled up and obviously was doing a lot of very particular research um, you know, how she was going to structure this thing. And, and like you said, and I think that this is actually really a great point to bring up, is the collaboration for pieces like this. You know, I mean, it's it's analogous to a lot of other processes in art. You know, like if you're, if you're making an album, you're working with maybe a producer, a sound engineer, maybe you have a band, and it's not just one person. You know, art pieces like this require a team. And I think often we think about, you know, the the, the lonely, obsessive artist, but 
it has to be a collaborative work, especially on that scale. And I think like that's another really beautiful part of this sculpture. You know, again, it's for like anyone could look at this and maybe enjoy it. And she had to work with other people. You know, it's her vision and other people uh, helped her make it come to life. But like you said, well, she, and- she kind of scaled up and you would have to, right? Like, you know, Christo, like he had how many people helping him put up his installations? You know, those really big ones. You have to have others. Oh yeah, and and I do I do have to to be the the pedantic person and say Christo and Jean Claude because it was husband and wife duo. That was a oh. collaborative. Um, but like, uh, I, yeah, one of them passed a, a few years before the other. But for most of most of those big things that people often shorthand as Christo, I always feel bad because it was Christo and Jean Claude. What I'm um, thinking of specifically is the. Um, installation that was you know outside and going through like a valley and some mountains it was those big red sheets of fabric um and i'm not i mean who did that was that christo or that was uh you know i i I honestly couldn't tell you off the top of my head whether that was christo or christo and jean-claude because like i said most of those installations were done with massive amounts of fabric and most of them were a collaborative but like i said one one passed before the other so you know the later stuff i think was just christo but um you know it it was just it was just uh because of because of the fact that we had talked about like acknowledging other people who contribute and i think the other thing that i wanted to to say about um about just acknowledging other contributions of other artists is Agarwal. It's not just the vision and, and like the, the hired assistants who put this together, but it, it like, I don't think she was designing the bells. So somewhere down the line, there was an industrial designer and there were people working in factories that their work is often, not recognized but in some way whenever we see these things that are put together with with essentially like found objects like there's a much broader collaboration happening you know yeah that often goes unnoticed and and i always like to try to point that out just because there are a lot of people creating creating things that are used and appropriated by other artists and i think you know we should give some credit to to that as well I agree. I think it's one of the, you know, most, one of the most important, at least to me, I think one of the most important pieces of making art um, is the collaborative aspect of it for a lot of different reasons. But, you know, I'll never forget when I was younger, um, I was like writing music and I was in a band and I had this idea for this song. And uh, the person that was playing drums in this group was like, you know, what if we did this and I felt myself getting like kind of upset about the suggestion, which I think I was taking as a criticism. Um, and I was kind of, you know, bristled at it. And then later he was like, you know, part of being in a band is like sharing ideas and like shaping the, the end product. And, you know, you should just be curious and, and try it, like just try it and, and see, you know, what comes from it. And Hey, if you don't like it, you don't have to do it. But it was really pivotal because I realized I'm like, yeah, he's right. You know, like oftentimes it's really helpful to get another person's perspective. You know, we think about that all the time in terms of like getting advice. You want a soundboard art. I don't think is any different. It's really helpful to have other perspectives involved. And, you know, I think this artist going back to her i mean she clearly understands the value of that and i think um you have to have a level of humility uh, and also intelligence to do that i mean really merging those two characteristics in order to get your end goal you know created and i, I think that's part of her brilliance is um she's obviously brilliant and talented and there's also a humility to her work because it cannot be done by one person and i i mean that's so cool to me yeah, and I think I think uh, you really encapsulated something um, really fundamental to the creative process in taking in uh, taking in feedback, taking in and considering other perspectives, being open to new ideas, to learning, to growth. Um, 
you know, often there's this there's this misperception of an artist as this solitary genius who has this vision and they they know better than the critics, you know. Um, but really the best artists learn from and they whether they agree or disagree, they take in and listen with an open mind and consider all different viewpoints and all different ideas. Yeah. That's yeah. a really that's a really good point. I mean, and I think for a lot of people, especially, you know, I think when people are younger and this adults are I guess also subject to this is, you know, there's there's a lot of ego in art. There's a lot of ego in music there can be. Um, oh, absolutely. Right? I mean, it's like these are begin as personal um you know, creation stem from personal experiences and feelings. And so, you know, often well, we all have that fantasy that we'll put something out there and everybody will just jaws will drop and people will celebrate <laughs> it as the most amazing thing that has ever been made in the history of the world. You know, oh, yeah. Is, is it clearly true? once I make a painting, it is the first perfect painting in the history of the world. Right. You know? Clearly. I mean, yeah. And, and there's, I think in art and in other professions too, I mean, you know, I work I work at a law firm and I listen to attorneys talk all day and they're really, really smart people. And one of the things that I've learned from them is, you know, they can state a series of facts in the most complex manner you could think of. But at the end of the day, that's not going to help them reach their goal, which is to, you know, succinctly state a series of facts that the majority of people can understand. And it's you know, art, it's interesting. We, we maybe have these really complex off the walls, I off the wall ideas, and we want other people to engage with it in the same way that we do, but that might not actually be the most effective way to do it, to do that. Right. And so it's like, it's always, you know, to the extent someone's goal is to have a little bit more of a universal experience, um, for the, the listener or the viewer, it's really hard to achieve, right? But there are things we can do by listening to other people um, during like a workshop or critique that help us get there. And I mean, that's, again, another value of working with others. Um, I mean, this artist, obviously, with the amount of research she did, she was constantly collecting information about really specific things and then putting it into a form that like all different kinds of people could enjoy. I mean, that's, it's stunning. <laughs> the the yeah. process is stunning. The art is stunning. It's so cool. And I'm wrapping it up. I want to... Just a three-point rating scale. And Where should this hang? The Lou? Is this something to look at? The lab. the lab? Is this something to learn from? Or the Lou? British for the bathroom. Yeah. There's, There's a poop joke in there somewhere. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. Well, I have a feeling I think... Uh, I know what you're going to say, so I'll let you go first, and then I'll go if you want. <laughs> oh, I always like to let the guest go oh, first. Noted. Okay. I mean, yeah, I think this would uh, go in the uh, Louvre. Yeah, I, I fully agree for all the, the reasons we've already talked about. Like, this is just... I think I think this is masterful because of the the different layers to it. The fact that, you know your immediate gut reaction even if you don't know anything about it it's awe inspiring because of because of the scale because of the the form of it because of like just the the neatness of execution and the sensory experience and then as you as you learn more and as you linger it you know it just it takes on new meaning and you know there's this meditative quality to it that that i i find very just soothing and enjoyable but also to learn from and that's what i feel like museum pieces are all about yeah the uh, everything you said i agree with and the the only thing that i could maybe add to that really awesome description that you just gave is that i think this piece would go really well in a museum that has you know high foot traffic because i think everyone um has the ability to, to learn something from this piece or enjoy this piece or interact with this piece. I really think this is something that basically most people can get down with. And I think, but that's not to say that everybody would have the same experience. I just think that a lot of people would enjoy it and learn from it. And, you know, I think that's what great art is. 
Yeah. And well, that's funny, though, because that's like the one thing I think I'm disagreeing with you about is the high foot traffic, because I feel like this is something that needs to be in a in a large, almost cavernous space that is calm. And like it, it to me, it's it's funny because it feels so massive and overpowering. And yet it feels like the experience I want from it is more quiet and intimate where it's just like me with that figure to be able to just like appreciate the stillness and then be enveloped by the the sound and the the sensory experience interesting yeah no i could i can definitely see that it's, like I, um, I see it like i see it like kusama's um infinity rooms in in that sort of sense where it's like just let people go in like one at a time for a few seconds you know sure so with the high foot traffic i don't think i necessarily meant like everybody looking at it or trying to interact with it at the same time but yeah just in a place where a lot of people have access to it yeah it would be great to be in a room alone with that are you kidding that would be incredible (laughs) yeah like like i say i so I, I think we both feel like everybody should see it. Yeah. Everybody should have access to it, but probably small groups at a time or something, you know, is the best experience of it because that seems ideal. There's just, yeah. So uh, thank you so much for taking the time to to do, do this. I, I really appreciate your flexibility and your schedule and taking the time. It's always fun to talk to you and especially to talk about an awesome work of art. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for uh, having me on. This was so fun, and this is really cool that you're doing this. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted? If you found this tolerable, please like and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week in the show notes on Twitter at WoodArtEd and on the website whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.